Light a campfire, and everyone's a storyteller. Join us for some thought-provoking and beyond fireside chats. My name is Kasha, and I'm once again chatting to Toby Sinclair from End Beyond Asia. Toby is back to tell us a little bit more about his adventures this time in Sri Lanka. Welcome back, Toby. Thank you very much for having me back. It's rather brave of you. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. We've had a lot of fun hearing a lot about your adventures in, in India and in Nepal. And now it's time to move on to another country and find out a little bit about Sri Lanka. Toby, your first visit to Sri Lanka was in 1980. How did you end up there? What, what took you there? And, and tell us a little bit about it. I went there on holiday in August 1980. 40 years ago, it's quite a frightening thought. A friend of mine, Dieter Plager, with whom I had lived in Kathmandu uh, when I first went to work for Tiger Tops, was a filmmaker. And after he had made his some film on tigers and a film on uh, leopards in uh, India, he moved down to Sri Lanka to do part of a film on elephants. And I, some of it was being made in Assam in India, and I had helped him get permits for that. Then he had gone down to Sri Lanka to do the other half, and there was a translocation of elephants in 1980 with someone called Ian Hofmeyer, who was a head vet from Namibia, actually. I went down there to stay with him, see what he was doing, and he had moved on from the elephant film by that stage and was filming white-bellied sea eagles. There's a park called Galoya, not often visited in those days. So I went to Wilpatu National Park. I went to Galoya and spent a week or so with um, Dita. And I traveled mm-hmm. elsewhere on the island looking at what my son used to refer to as broken stones. Mm-hmm. And I called very distinguished archaeological sites and was learning. I just got to know the island. No other plans and no expectations to go back there and work on films. And I didn't revisit the island very often. I think I went once between 1980 and 1995, so over a 15-year period, when I went down to join a colleague of mine who was producing a series about the natural history of South Asia called Land of the Tiger. And we went on a long recce trip. Mike Burkhead was the producer, and his brother Tim was with us, and he's a world-famous ornithologist, author of some wonderful books. So we traveled, they were both ornithologists, these two brothers, but Mike was very focused and he was looking at stories and what we could film for the Land of the Tiger series, what we could film in Sri Lanka that was distinctly Sri Lankan and would fit into our the overall plan. And what we could fit, film in Sri Lanka that also sort of matched up with what we were doing in India. So inevitably, part of it was elephants, where we could film elephants, and we went to see a friend of mine who was making a film called The Temple Truth about monkeys, about uh, tok macaques in Polonuara. We didn't, in the end, film tok macaques for Land of the Tiger, but we did film elephants. And Tim Burkett and myself had a wonderful time on this 20-day recce because we managed to do 26 out of the then known 28 endemic bird species. Mm -hmm found on the island. So for me, it was a sort of journey of discovery. It was also a place that a few years later, I came back to film other things, which was a Mm spin-off out of Land of a Tiger. It almost sounds a little bit incongruous, you know, filming Land of a Tiger in Sri Lanka, a country which doesn't have any tigers. How did that fit into the general concept of the series? Well, there were six one-hour programs being made by the BBC Natural History Unit, Mm -hmm. being co-produced with PBS in the States, ABC Australian Broadcasting, and other overseas broadcasters. And at the end, I sort of lost count, but it was eventually broadcast in the days of terrestrial television in 1997 to coincide with the 50th anniversary of India's independence. So there were these six episodes, and one was a general introduction which we call the Tiger's Domain, which is really the peninsular India. Then we did an episode on sacred waters, which was about the great rivers of India. And we did an episode on the Himalaya, which included filming in Nepal, Pakistan, and Bhutan, in addition to India, the Indian Mm -hmm. Himalaya, where we filmed snow leopards. The fourth episode was about the seas, the oceans around India, 
and the islands. I mean, India has some amazing islands that people tend to overlook. Lakshwadeep off the west coast, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands off the coast of Thailand to the far east of the Bay of Bengal. So the fifth program was about deserts. And the sixth program was about the sort of Western Ghats and the South Indian rainforests. And it's one of the great global hotspots together with the forests of Sri Lanka. And it's a sort of combined hotspot over in two countries separated by a, bit of, a tiny bit of water. So that took us back to Sri Lanka. Apart from Sri Lanka, historically, all these lands had tigers. Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, India, and Pakistan. Pakistan had, there were tigers as far west as the Indus River, historically. The jury is still out. I mean, there are four skeletons that have been found in Sri Lanka in mm -hmm. a gem pit where they were mining for sapphires. And they are probably tigers. And they're probably from about 10,000 years ago. And so about the time that the last ice age was receding, it's probable, in fact, we know it was true until about five and a half yes. to 6,000 years ago, Sri Lanka was physically linked to India. There was a land bridge between the two countries. So tigers may have moved down through peninsular India. Tigers originated probably in East Asia and moved mm -hmm. into India, relatively recent in biological terms, and probably, possibly, had moved down through India into Sri Lanka, a few into Sri Lanka, but never enough to establish a dynamic population that would survive. So, stretching it a bit, the whole of the Indian subcontinent, and this program mm -hmm. was to celebrate India's 50 years of independence. The program was called Land of the Tiger. Yes. So it was really sort of using that iconic animal of India to draw attention to the whole region. Obviously, the tiger has become quite a symbol for India's wildlife. In a way, it's kind of called attention to other species that do actually live in India. Do you find that there's a lot of awareness in general about wildlife in Sri Lanka and the species that occur there? Or is it perhaps not quite as well known as India? It's not as well known on a global basis, but locally... There is a lot of awareness, and they are very proud that the dominant predator in Sri Lanka, if we exclude man and the damage that man does to the environment, the dominant predator is the leopard. It's got a very wide spread mm -hmm. leopard population. There are leopards in the dry scrub areas, there are leopards in the hill country, there are leopards in forest areas, there are leopards up in the hill country up to about eight, seven and a half to 8,000 feet. And they were more widespread. Sri Lanka is a country with about 22 million people. It's not very large. It's about the size of Tasmania. But it has an amazing range of habitats from arid zone, sort of near desert-like conditions, but in small patches, to wet tropical rainforests. It has montane cloud forests. It has scrub forests. It has... Sand forests in patches in Wilpatu National Park, rather similar to what you have in northern Pinda, in fact, in a very small, isolated area. Mm -hmm. It has wetlands, it has coasts, it has seas, it has reefs. This tiny space has quite a variety of landscapes. And in those landscapes, it has a variety of animals. So... The big animals of elephants and leopards are the ones that are the put on the T-shirts and on the posters and onto travel brochures. But there is an awful lot more in Sri Lanka. I have been lucky enough to see and love mm -hmm. going out looking for nocturnal animals in Sri Lanka. Lorises, there's an endemic race of slender loris in Sri Lanka, which is a proto-simian early primitive primate not unlike a bush baby from Africa. There are fishing cats, which are found throughout South Asia. There are the smallest of the world's wild cats, which are the rusty spotted cats, which I used to see a lot of when I was filming leopards in Yala National Park in 2000, 2001. And we would drive out of the park after dark, and we would often see these little cats beside the road. But they also live in villages in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. in, the, in the thatch of village houses. 
we have martins, civets. Mm-hmm. So we have some very interesting small nocturnal mammals, otters. You don't see otters very often, though. And I love that side of Sri Lanka's wildlife. And then we have primates. We have endemic primates in Sri Lanka, including the tokmakak, which has been studied at Polonuaro mm-hmm. for over 40 years by the Smithsonian. Same scientist and his team of some helpers. The team has changed, but the scientist hasn't, uh, Dr. Wolfgang Ditters. And he, over the last 25 years, has kept on popping up in my life, as I will explain in a moment. And then you have a purple-faced leaf monkey, or a langur, which has different morphs, which is an endemic species, but even within the, a small island has different morphs. So in the lowland area, mm-hmm. you have them looks much more like a, a normal langur. But in the highlands, they're very furry and bushy, and they're referred locally as bear monkeys. We have the loris, we have this purple-faced leaf monkey in different morphs, and we have the tokmakak. So with these endemic primates, it's another reason why I find Sri Lanka so interesting and varied. And then in terms of amphibians and herbs, it's second only in amphibian diversity and butterfly diversity to Costa Rica. And that's often overlooked by people. I mean, Sri Lanka has an amazing diversity. Mm-hmm. In birds, we now consider the not the 26 endemic bird species that I was looking at 25 years ago, but we're now have 35 endemic bird species, including two species that have been discovered in the last 15 years, which were not in the old books. So there's still stuff to find out. There's still stuff to discover. And it's a country, as I said, with 22 million people. Yeah. But... Uh, about 29% of the country is protected either as wildlife reserves or national parks or an area which is even stricter, called a strict nature reserve, or forest department, some of which is worked timbered tim- for timber. But it's close to 30%, and the country has an ambition to reforest another 4 to 5% try and bring it up to 34 to 35% of the land cover. And that's a pretty remarkable ambition for a tiny place with a growing human population. Absolutely. But it certainly sounds like there's an absolutely incredible diversity of wildlife and a lot of really unexpected species and species that are still sort of being discovered and, and found out about. Yes. I mean, every year I read about a new skink or a new not so often frog species, but uh, little critters, taxonomists find something and then they say, no, the ones in this valley are actually different from the ones in the other the valley behind, across that mountain. So you have the splitters and the lumpers in both bird taxonomy and amphibian <laughs> taxonomy. But I do find it fascinating. I and mean, of course, genetics is making a huge difference, not something I understand, but I respect. And take the word of the scientists. If they say, no, this is genetically different from a similar looking creature which is found the other side of that mountain. I think what we've realized that in tropical mm-hmm. countries, the speciation of small species in small areas is very distinct. And in the past, so much of our, what we know about animals and has been based on 19th century or early 20th century country collectors and we know a lot more now and we have new tools in the form of dna readings so new data new species so sri lanka has great wealth in terms of its biodiversity but making films which took me back to sri lanka first with land of the tiger and then i went back to film elephants for a bbc one hour program called the last tusker and that was when i got completely involved in the same way as I do in India. We have a story, we find the story, I go in, help do the research, find the scientists, find locations, find, get the permissions, and do the, handle the logistics. So we made a program called The Last Tusker for BBC and Animal Planet that went and was released in 2001. So actually we did start working on that in 1999. Mm-hmm. While I was there, I met 
someone who became a very good friend, Jahan Kumara, and is now, in fact, part of our and beyond team, the director of our Sri Lankan operations. <laughs> he is a businessman, but he had been studying leopards in Yala National Park from the late 90s, along with two other people. Mm -hmm. And they used to go and spend about six to eight days every month there. I think partly their businesses were doing reasonably well, but they weren't so doing so well that they had to be in Colombo all the time. So they did this for years. Every month they would go and spend this period of time. Mm -hmm. So their monitoring of Yana and their, get, their knowledge base that they built up was phenomenal. And, and no science had been done in that part other than a Smithsonian survey in the late 1970s. So working with these people, we went and said, well, maybe there's a story. We can go and film leopards in Yana. Mm -hmm. So we got a commission from the BBC and it was co-produced with PBS in the States to make a film. But it was really difficult to get the leopard behavior, the sequences. We got shots. We saw leopards crossing a road. We saw leopards in the distance on a rock. But we weren't getting things happening. The producer started panicking, which meant that I panicked because my job was on the line. And somehow, along, probably on a boozy evening, we decided, around a campfire, mm -hmm. we decided that perhaps we should put the cameraman in the story. So here's this cameraman coming out to Sri Lanka to film leopards. He's met up with this local researcher, Jahan Kumara, and we follow them looking for the leopards. And that's what we did. And the program became was called The Leopard Hunters. And the cameraman was someone called Gordon Buchanan, who had been, he'd been working, he'd done about 10 years' work prior to that. But this was the first time that he was in front of the camera. The producer, and occasionally myself, were filming the cameraman at work while he tried to film leopards. And we ended up with this film. And Gordon hasn't looked back. He has become a very, very successful producer of natural history films now, mm -hmm. working around the world, but mainly in the Americas and Asia, and a lot of work in Scotland, where he's where based. So that's been quite exciting. And so we made these two one-hour films for the BBC in the early 2000s. And from the Leopard film, I worked with these colleagues, Jahan and a couple of other friends, and I edited and put together a book called mm -hmm. For the Leopard. It was a tribute to Sri Lanka's leopards. And that did quite well. It was published locally, and we did rather well. And that the money that we earned from that book, was we had the book completely sponsored, so 100% of the income from the book went to form a trust called the Leopard Trust, which still exists and with which and beyond works today in Sri mm -hmm. Lanka on various projects. So as with so many little accidents that happened 20 years ago or more, suddenly they become part of your mainstream life. And the one-off mm -hmm. leopard film has continued to resonate through the next 20 years with the work of the Leopard Trust and other things that I've been involved with. That's an amazing legacy to leave behind. Well, I can't claim any real responsibility for it. I've just been a part party to it. And these things are all mm. collective and team efforts. And it's just a privilege mm. to be involved. It is amazing. But as you say, it's an example of serendipity, everything coming together at the right time. Yes. And then, I mean, another echo of the past, in a sense, was uh, in 2001, there was a series called Life of Mammals, with, presented by D David Attenborough, for which I'd done mm -hmm. seven different shoots in India. The producer decided that he really wanted to go down and film Tokmakaks, where this is a different producer, where he had filmed the Pebble Troop when I met him in 1995 on the recce. And so David went down there and filmed at Polnumara. It was just a five day shoot, which was a wonderful privilege to work with a great man. And then, and then 10 years after that, we managed to get a commission. I called my friend, got a commission from Disney to make a feature film, a wildlife feature film around these macaques and we originally we thought we'd do a real life jungle book making a remake of jungle book partly in india partly in sri lanka and then disney decided to remake the cartoon version of jungle book which they did about five years ago i suppose so the disney nature weren't in a position weren't going to get the funding to make 
a wildlife documentary. So we concentrated on the macaque, which included bears and leopards and elephants. But it was a story about these troops of monkeys, of macaques, that lived within the ancient 800 to 1,000 year old ruins of Polynuara. Came a Disney feature film called Monkey Kingdom, which was released mm-hmm. in 3,000 cinemas across the United States in 2016. And that was a completely different experience from what I've done earlier. Mm. It must have been a very different process to do a feature film rather than documentary. Well, it was still a documentary. What the difference really was, was the luxury we had Mm -hmm. of a Disney budget. When you make a film for television, your budgets, in the old days, they were actually quite generous, uh, are in reality today a fraction of that. In real terms, it's more like a quarter to a third. But certainly to be able to have a Disney budget to make a feature film. In the old days, when we made a documentary, if we're lucky, we had between 150 and 200 days over an 18-month period. Nowadays, if you're lucky, you get 50 days. Suddenly, Disney came along and we managed to film for two and a half years. And we managed to have two crews and we had two of the best wildlife cameramen in the world working both of whom I'd worked with before. I knew many of the team from earlier, and they're all ex-BBC, now working with Disney on a freelance basis. So it was a lot of fun. It was a huge learning, working again wow. with Dr. Dittus and his research, Smithsonian research team at Polynuara. And the film did pretty well. Tina Fey did the commentary, the voiceover. One regret I sort of have for these Disney films is that the commentaries are often focused or geared for a more universal audience. So you don't always have the hard, scientific commentaries that I'm mm-hmm. used to with BBC. But listen, that's a small price to pay for two and a half years of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it's really fascinating to get a little bit of a glimpse behind the scenes into something like that. And I wonder how many of the people who who, ever, who saw that film would have ever even thought about all the work and all the time and effort that went into it. It's, it's quite an amazing process. It is. But I, I don't know if they think about that so much, but what Disney has created, a genre of natural history feature films. The most recent one was one on elephants in Botswana from the same team, which I didn't like the commentary at all, but I, the images and the and the sort of backup making of film were extraordinary, uh, fun and interesting. And the first of this series, yes. and interestingly, it's headquartered out of Paris. Disney Nature makes one film a year, gets released. It's for the American market. It's funded by America. It uh, gets released throughout Europe and other, a few other countries. Uh, it gets cinema release in Britain, but, in, but because Britain has such good natural history films, documentaries on television, which are more or less free. People don't go to the cinemas to see, or at least in the pre-COVID era, they didn't go to the cinemas to see a wildlife documentary. But in America, they did very well. And the first one was March of the Penguins. And they did a program on flamingos in East Africa, Kenya. They then did uh, one on bears in Alaska, uh, chimpanzees in West Africa, big cats, African cats yeah. on the plains of uh, Lamara. And elephants recently in Botswana. So and I think they're doing another one on penguins and something on dolphins. They only get released once a year, but in fact, uh, they occasionally skip a year. So in the last 12 years, they've probably done 10 films. So it's a very small niche business for Disney. But they make money, and they have huge budgets, and a few lucky people get to make them and spend time in these amazing natural wildernesses. It was lovely to have a, to be able to focus on a single species for a long period of time. And as I said, my job was sort of making sure that there was, the beer was cold and the coffee was good at the end of the day. We had to get there first, but that was my end, my final job. And it's a role that I'm happily <laughs> take on and assume. I have a feeling that's simplifying it quite a bit. <laughs> well, but at about the same time, we, uh, there was another overlapping project in Sri Lanka. And these two projects allowed us, I needed an office to, inter- to support it. I needed to create a team. So that was really when we got 
that went and beyond opened its office in Sri Lanka uh, and was functional by 2012. And mm -hmm. I got a couple of people to come in and join me, help me locally. We had a lovely team and we have grown to what we have today. But the seed for both those, for setting up the and beyond operations in Sri Lanka were these two films, Disney film, Monkey Kingdom, and a three-part series that I helped make for National Geographic mm -hmm. called Wild Sri Lanka. And that was the first time in Sri Lanka that I'd been able to get, we'd been able to work on a film or be part of a project that looked at the small stuff as well as the big stuff. I mean, one episode was, again, was about the ocean. So we did a lot of diving, filming on rocks and reefs, uh, wrecks off the west coast and mm -hmm. south coast of Sri Lanka. So we were filming with diving with sperm whale pods of sperm whales, resident blue whales, managed to take a helicopter up and film pods of literally thousands of spinner dolphins off the west coast of Sri Lanka. We know that a collective name for a pod of, of dolphins and whales are pods, but this was multiple pods. Up to 10,000 have been recorded in a single area. But it wouldn't be uncommon going out in a boat. And I remember doing a recce with my colleague Suhail Gupta when he came down to uh, see what we were doing in Sri Lanka. We would see a couple of hundred spinner dolphins around the boat. And this is in a mm -hmm. uh, And that's special. Plus a lot of other dolphin species, pilot whales, orcas, bottlenose dolphins, and many others. So the oceans were one of the three films being made for wild Sri Lanka. Another episode looked at the rainforests and the montane forests, what they call cloud forests, forests that get a lot of their moisture from clouds rather than from rain itself. So that was a lot of small creatures. Again, the bear monkey, the endemic montane race of the uh, purple-faced leaf monkey, lorises, fishing cats at night, and a lot of amphibians and endemic birds in, in these rainforest areas. So that was the second episode. And the third one looked at the big animals of jungle of the forests and the scrub forests, the leopards, the sloth birds, uh, the deer, and, of course, elephants. So to work on these two films overlapping to an extent, but very independent, very different operations. National Geographic making three one-hour programs and Disney making a 90-minute feature film, a cinema release focused on a single species, gave us the foothold and a not fantastic knowledge base in Sri Lanka and a great team that really knew how to operate off the beaten track. And that's what we have today. And we're very lucky. That's an amazing basis to have built up on. I see that the interest in, in wildlife in Sri Lanka seems to have grown and developed, you know, from a tiny role in the land of the tiger to documentaries focusing specifically on, on specific species. And then what you were just talking about now, Wild Sri Lanka, a whole series about Sri Lanka in itself. What do you think comes next for Sri Lanka's wildlife? It's a double-edged sword making these films. You, you, you document them, you share information mm -hmm worldwide with more and more television channels commissioners want more product in a sense but they don't want to pay much for it they want it to be more exciting so people some people compromise luckily the people that i've worked with tend not to compromise mm -hmm. we, we deliver what we see we don't pretend to be doing something else but with more coverage greater coverage comes greater awareness in the public, which becomes a greater demand to come and visit the stuff in the wild. So that more pressure, tourism pressure onto places. It also gives us more responsibilities. I mean, one of the things that we did as and Beyond Lanka, when I was looking after that office for many years, mm -hmm. was part of our sort of Care for the Wild project. We sponsored fishing cat study, uh, looking at fishing cats in uh, urban wetlands around Colombo, and wetlands are vitally important, but also rather attractive mm -hmm. to developers and urban planners who think they can build on wetlands, forgetting that 
wetlands have been created by nature to handle floods and other problems. So the science that we helped sponsor in the firm, camera trapping of these leopard cats mm -hmm. and collaring them, uh, radio tracking them, strengthen the arguments to protect the wetlands around the city. So not only are those wetlands are important for air and light and water and drainage for the citizens of the city, but they are also home to an incredible species, a cat mm -hmm. that swims, a cat that fishes, a cat with webbed feet. So that was rather exciting. So we had a tiny role as and beyond sponsoring that. So part of our responsibility under the sort of and beyond ethos of care for the people, care for the land, and care for the wild, I focused on care for the wild on this one project. Mm -hmm. And we did a few other things as well. We There was a very bad monsoon, uh, bad in the sense of a lot of road damage in, in a park called Wilpatu to the north of Colombo. And the Forest Department, the Wildlife Department, didn't have any cash at that moment. So we quite literally took cash you know, out of our bank account one day and went up there and paid for the fuel so the Wildlife Department could get bulldozers in to clear the roads that had been damaged by, in the floods, uh, which would then enable them to patrol properly and to protect the park. Mm -hmm. So there was a little sort of a bit of emergency fund you did a comparatively small amount, but it makes a difference if it's used at the right time in a targeted way. What we learned making wild Sri Lanka, both in the birds and the amphibians and the small mammals, uh, has given us a knowledge base and a team that we have these experienced naturalist guides now and gave us a responsibility. And I hope that we will always continue to meet mm -hmm. those responsibilities and help local scientists do their work. Absolutely. Now, I realize at the moment the whole world is, is on hold while, while COVID happens. Can you tell us a little bit about what are and beyond plans going ahead in Sri Lanka? As you said, you've spoken about this body of knowledge that we've built up about the country, about its wildlife. How can we use that and, and roll it forward? As a touring company, which is what we are in Sri Lanka predominantly, we have areas of specialization. Despite 40 years of working with wildlife, my sort of all-consuming passion really is, uh, is history and archaeology. And so we are very geared up for running, organizing tours in Sri Lanka, looking at archaeological mm -hmm. sites, of which there are many th hundreds. Uh, some of them are amazing. There are also seven World Heritage Sites, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. But we also, I mean, people want to go and stay in lovely old tea estates, and converted bungalows, or flop on a beach. So we handle those programs for people. And using our wildlife knowledge, we have a lovely team of experienced naturalist guides, and we work with them very closely, crafting a standard tour of Sri Lanka with a little bit of better access, or focused programs. We've run programs for people to come and watch dragonflies and butterflies in Sri Lanka. We've done quite a few birding tours, and that, those are very popular. We have an inquiry and hopefully will operate in early 21, but we, are, we now think it might become 22, for a program for amphibians. And it's just lovely. To, and an entomologist wants to come out and bring a small group of people to look at insects and other critters. So it's really exciting to, I mean, it's not just leopards and elephants or big birds. It's or the charismatic creatures. It's also all the other layers and layers and layers and layers. And it's rather as we're finding now across the mm -hmm. world, I mean, one of the largest and most extraordinary parts of the natural world are fungi. and when I grew up, I mean, we had mushrooms on toast, but that was about the limit to our experience with, with fungi. But we now realize that you have some of these individual organisms are huge. There is one in Oregon, I think, in, North, in Western United States that is un predominantly underground and, co and covers an area 
of many square miles, and it's a single organism, <laughs> and it's relatively recently discovered, and it's not something that you can very easily make a film about. So it doesn't get onto television in the mainstream, and it's not an <laughs> elephant, it's not a leopard, it's not a primate. It's just not sexy enough for many people. But in fact, it is fascinating, and it's the sort of it's a communication system in the earth for plants. And on the fungi, other fungi live. And I can't tell you anymore because I don't understand it. But it's extraordinary. Just a, it's sort of head expanding as a concept and something that I'd love That's to incredible. learn more about. So if someone wrote to me and said, mm -hmm. I would love to come and look at fungi in Sri Lanka, I'm mm -hmm. lucky I actually mm -hmm. do know someone who is, a, is, in, is sort of understands it. And we do have someone to go to. And but how we would construct it, I can't tell you today, but I'm confident that we would be able to put something together. What an and beyond plan. So, I mean, at the moment, we are predominantly a touring company across South Asia. As you know, we have a plan to open a lodge next year in Bhutan, the Punaka mm -hmm. Lodge, which is very exciting. And my colleagues and I have been looking at various places in Sri Lanka. And we've had some plans, and our Simon Naylor from our uh, so conservation manager from Pinder has been our Mark Wheeler, our managing director, now based in the UK. So, Hail Gupta, my colleague and managing director for South Asia, myself and our Sri Lankan team, including Jahan Kumara. We have been looking at ideas, looking at places, looking at possibilities, and we definitely hope to work closely with both the wildlife departments mm. and the forest departments and develop a quality lodge experience in Sri Lanka, which will be part of a project to put something back into the Sri Lankan landscape, caring for the wild, caring for the land, and caring for the people. And we believe yes. responsible tourism would work in Sri Lanka. And it, it is overdue for a, a, a there are a few small local examples. We believe we can knock it up a couple of notches and do it well and do something that benefits the country. It certainly sounds as though Sri Lanka is the ideal place for the end beyond model. There's certainly a lot of potential. When land is at a premium and human, the human population in Sri Lanka is actually not growing very fast. Of all the South Asian countries, the rate of growth is lowest. But it has, Colombo is now a city of one and a half million. Sri Lanka is a, city, is a country of 22 million. But it's not galloping away out of control. The need for resources is galloping out of control. So the need for land, for agriculture, to try and be more self-sufficient, especially in this post-COVID world. The need for, you know, trying to develop light industry, which would enable to generate export income for the country, are all threats to the land and the landscape. So we hope that we can do something and rescue a few places, rewild possibly uh, an area, bring back both smaller and big mammals into an area, not really following the Pindam model of repop by moving animals, but by protecting an area, wild animals will move into that protected space on their own. And that is what I believe we can do and should do in Sri Lanka. And I hope we will be able to do it. I mean, these are my personal thoughts, but I think they fall within the scope of and ideas of what the company is about. Well, I sincerely hope we'll be able to have you back one of these days to tell us about these plans being put into action. I would love to share that with you. I can't wait to see what we can do. Fantastic. Thank you, Toby. You really, you've painted an absolutely vivid and beautiful picture of Sri Lanka, and you've certainly inspired me to go and visit. So thank you very much for your time as usual. Please be with us. Come and join us. Thank you for listening to Leave Our World a Better Place. Don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode. If you'd like to find out more about and beyond, please log on to our website at andbeyond.com.